Hello everyone, and welcome once again to CS300 Software Engineering. As always, I'm Bart Massey, and as always, I hope you're staying safe and well out there during this difficult time. Today I want to talk about Scrum, which is probably the leading method or methodologies or whatever that's being used in the real world of industrial software development around the Portland area and really around the world increasingly. It's an important topic, I think, and it deserves some attention. I have been trained as a Scrum developer, but I certainly am not super experienced with it. I'm gonna tell you what I know based on the, what the book says and what I've seen from my training and experience. I also am gonna to try to provide some other video links to videos that are already out there in the wild that are maybe better videos about Scrum. So I encourage you to check out what I've got to say, but I also encourage you to look more widely. Scrum is a big topic. With that said, let's dive in. So what's Scrum? Well, it's a particular process. By the way, the word Scrum comes from rugby. In rugby, a scrum is where everybody piles in together and pushes to achieve some common goal. Um, well, each team has a different goal usually. Uh, and so that's sort of the inspiration for this term scrum. But what scrum is, is an agile software development process. It consists of a bunch of specific practices that you're supposed to follow as part of the software development process to be able to achieve quick, effective development of high quality software in a reasonable way. So I'm just gonna give you the quick 10,000 foot view. The development team has two special roles. What's a role? It's just something that some person does. And the roles in a scrum team that are special are gonna be the scrum master and the product owner and everybody else is a developer on the team. And we'll talk later about the specific things that the Scrum Master do and the product does and the product owner does as part of this process. But those are the roles involved. So typically Scrum works best with teams of five to eight people counting the Scrum Master and product owner. So you might have three to um, six developers in a particular scrum team more than that and it tends to be unruly less than that and it tends to be hard to deal with too for different reasons so yeah what are the artifacts that we're working with well obviously there's the code artifacts themselves which i didn't list here but we're producing a software product so there's all the usual stuff there there's also these process artifacts the product backlog and the sprint backlog and i'll talk about those but basically that's the list of things we need to do for the project and the list of things we need to be doing right now for the project. And like I say, I'll detail that in a bit. What does the activity cycle look up look like? Well, we do a little bit of setup, hopefully as little as possible. The goal here is to keep things simple and quick. And then we start doing what's called sprints, which are little timed sections of work that we do one after the other. And again, I'll talk more about that. So. So the overview sort of is that that setup is that when we start, we gather user stories and scenarios. We talked about those last week. We gather some idea of what it is we're gonna build. We select what features we're gonna have our product have to meet those user stories and scenarios. So we figure out what it is that are the features that our product's gonna have. And then we create what's called the product backlog, which I'll talk about in a bit, which is the list of things we need to do early on. And then we go through this process. We have a sprint planning meeting. We select the sprint, not spring, backlog. I'll have to remember to fix that in the notes. We select the sprint backlog. So that's, we select from the project backlog tasks that we're actually gonna do this sprint and then we do what's called a sprint. We eat, do some development as quickly as we can and do it well. There'll typically be meetings at the start of each day called daily standups that are very brief where everyone reports on what they're up to that day and how things went yesterday. 
those sprints are all fixed links. They're what's called time boxed. And at the end of each sprint, we'll have a review meeting talking about how the sprint went. We'll have a retrospective meeting, which is a meeting talking about how, you know, at the process level, talking about how things might have changed and that sort of thing. Um, the book doesn't mention retrospectives for some reason, which is a little weird. Um, and then we'll come back around and start the planning meeting for the next sprint. And how many sprints are we going to have? Well, how many does it take to get things done? And that's sort of part of the Agile philosophy is we generally try not to have real strict time bounds up front, which can be a real problem if you really do have a strict deadline. But a lot of the time, especially for web and mobile apps, your deadlines are a little bit flexible. And so you build things until they're done. So like I say, a sprint is what's called time box. There's a, each sprint in a project will have the same length of time. So I'll have a series of one week sprints or two week sprints or three week sprints or four week sprints. Typically you don't go longer than four weeks for a single sprint. That's not really a sprint anymore. You're not running fast, that's a marathon. Um, and less than one is sort of impractical because you have a meeting at the front and two at the back plus standups at some point, the overhead start really does start to be a problem. I think two weeks, I think short sprints are ideal. A lot of industry stuff is four weeks, but you know that's sort of the range that you're looking at for sprints. So every N weeks, where N is one or two or four, during the project, you say, well, this week, last week, last two weeks we did this, this two weeks we're gonna be doing that. And each sprint should produce a production ready chunk of code. At the end of each sprint, you should have code that you wrote during that sprint that's ready to use in your product and does something useful. Like I say, there's meetings at the start and the end, there's standups at the start of each day. And during the sprint, it isn't like you don't talk to each other except at the standups. The idea here is that you're all in the same room, but if you're not in the same room, you you know, use Zoom or whatever to communicate face to face. If you can't do that, well, then maybe you use a email to communicate, but you try really hard to talk to each other. It's really important. Keep talking about backlogs. So what's a backlog? Well, it's just a big bag of project ba backlog items. Well, what's a project backlog item, a PBI? Well, it's just a small unit of work, maybe a few hours of work, maybe a day of work at most, that is a task that needs to be done on the project. And what you'll do when you set up the project is you'll go through and figure out what are the things we know we need to do right now. You'll list them out somehow on paper or on the web or on index cards or whatever it is you're gonna do. And you'll have this backlog that's, oh, these are the tasks that are waiting to be done. We don't try not to leave anything out. You know, if you need to, as part of the uh, as part of developing this 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 software product, everybody's monitor needs to be cleaned. You put a clean the monitors task as a PBI, and you stuff it into the product backlog. Because if it's really important that the monitors get cleaned or nothing's going to get done, then you need to plan for that it needs to be part of what you're doing during the planning phase of stuff and of course conversely if as you're writing that down you go this is silly we don't actually need to clean the monitors to build this product well then yeah sure you throw it away but you then don't clean the monitors the idea here is to try to figure out what the minimum set of things is that you need to do to produce the product you want to produce and to do those in some reasonable order we do what's called dynamic refinement, which is, you know, I think of as an old school waterfall-y guy as work breakdown, which is this idea that, well, yeah, a lot of times the tasks are going to be pretty vague when you first put them in the backlog. And as you get them out, you're like, well, we know more now. We should break this task into smaller pieces um, or more detailed pieces. And so we'll throw away this big task and replace it with a bunch of little tasks in the backlog. Uh, and that's a real common thing to do there. During each planning meeting, one of the first tasks you do is something called the backlog review. You go through your uh, backlog, your product backlog, and you say, well, what items are ready for consideration? Marked ready for consideration. These are explicit markings. You mark the tasks like this. What items are ready for refinement? What items are 
ready for implementation. And you know, done items probably shouldn't be in the queue, but if they are, if they're in the backlog, then you know you might just go ahead and archive them somehow at that point. You check the statuses, you change the status of items as you need to, and then you pick some set of things, some set of PBIs that you're gonna do, and they become a sprint backlog items. You put them in a different pile, which is the pile of things you plan to do this sprint. So now you've got a bunch of tasks for this sprint that are things you wanna get done. The activities that the book talks about for the sprint planning meeting, and this is pretty standard, uh, standard Scrum stuff, but it's also pretty standard software engineering stuff. What kind of activities you know are planning? Well, refinement, that is figuring out in more detail what's what this task is and how it's gonna look. Estimation, how long is this thing gonna take? How much is it gonna cost? How many people do we need to do it? Uh, creation, you know, what is it that do we need to create some new tasks because things aren't on there yet that should in there yet that should be prioritization what do we want to do first and those four things are you know sort of generic you can sort of say that about any time you're planning anything but you certainly can say it about scrum and by the way there's the, there's a lot of sort of magic in scrum floating around so one of the tasks in planning is always to estimate effort how much how much effort is each of these tasks going to be and the traditional thing to do is to measure them in person hours oh yeah this would take one person four hours to do this thing uh a lot of scrum stuff talks about an imaginary made-up unit called story points which have no particular value except relative to each other so you decide that this is a one story point task this is a five story point task and that sort of disconnects you from the timeline which is both a good and a bad thing. It's a bad thing in that you'd like to know how long things are gonna take, but it's a good thing in that as you go, if you're sort of consistent about how you define a story point, uh, you start to measure what's called your velocity. In, in the retrospective at the end, one of the things you do is you, you typically go back and say, well, during the sprint, how much story points did we do in this length of time and that's good because as you start to na zero nail down what that number is going to be whether it's person hours or story points then when you're planning the next sprint you have some idea of what your team's capacity is and a big part of why scheduling is hard why milestones and deadlines are hard is because it's hard to know how much the team is going to be able to do and so one of the things you can do with this kind of systematic process is to get a better get better estimates out and better estimates are always great the um team dynamics during a sprint we haven't talked about the roles so much yet the scrum master is you know the the obvious thing with a name like scrum master is that it's some kind of team leader or pro or team manager and that's true but not true to some extent the role of the scrum master is to help the team organize themselves not more than to give them orders that typically the scrum master doesn't order the team to do anything but they will help them figure out what they want to do and how they want to do it part of their job is to make the team work as smoothly as possible uh that, that you know to help the team work as smoothly as possible by providing them things they need to work by helping them find things part of their job is to interface with management to ask management for things to keep management off their backs etc and facilitate the project in that way in any kind of project management whether it's scrum or anything else you know any kind of project development there's somebody whose job it is to interface with the management and one of their big jobs is to protect you from the management if you're a developer and that is a really important role and that's a good way to judge a manager and that's the scrum master's job in a scrum project so they have a lot of things to do but one of them isn't to sort of order this team around um, the team is supposed to figure out stuff on their uh, as a group uh, the product owner is an interesting position it is generally on a scrum team the least wanted position because it's can be painful because it's politically awkward the product owner is the person who sort of represents the customer. And that means that, or in the case of a software product, they may represent marketing or whoever, right? That they're the ones who are sort of charged with making sure that 
the product you're building is the thing that the customer wants or the thing that you can sell. And so they're in a little bit of an adversary position. They're in a little bit of a position of arguing with you because you want to do things the way the team wants to do it and produce the thing the team wants to produce. And they're like, no, 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 I don't think the customer, you know, that's not serving the customer well. And so that makes it awkward. The other thing is that typically the product owner is not part of development. The Scrum Master and the product owner typically don't develop code. Uh, and so that's a little awkward too, because now you've got this person sort of saying what's going on who's not part directly part of the development process. But it's a really important role. It's really typical that these, as you do your development, there's some kind of a board, whether it's literally a physical you know, cork board or whether it's a web page with some kind of Kanban board or whatever on it that you use to sort of post and distribute the sprint backlog items. So as the team's managing itself, it's typically by they come in there, do their stand up, and then they, you know, look through the sprint backlog for a task they can pick up and do, and they pick it up and do it. And when they've done that, they look through the sprint backlog for another task they can do. And maybe they talk with each other and with the scrum master and with whoever about, you know, what tasks should I be doing next? How should this go? And the idea is that by the end, if everybody keeps picking up tasks and doing them every day, by the end of the sprint, the sprint backlog will have been cleared. And that's that's the fantasy. And of course, in real life, that doesn't always happen. That's fine. Tasks that didn't get cleared from the sprint backlog go back into the product backlog. And now you're going to go do the planning meeting again. So that's sort of the process. Then at the end, you have a review meeting where you uh, look back at what you did this time and sort of understand where you are. That's typically the meeting where you do things like take unfinished tasks back into the product backlog, check which thing, tasks need to have their status changed. Um, and then there's what's called a retrospective, which is more about process than product, and you think about, um, think about how you're gonna do that. Typically, the uh, review meeting, the product owner's not at, the retrospective they are. And the customer will be invited to attend the retrospective. Um, so that's the process. And you just cycle it through. Every few weeks, you're going to have one of these little breaks where you do the cleanup from the previous sprint, then you plan the next sprint, and then you go off and sprint for a few weeks, and then you do the cleanup from the sprint and start the next sprint. And eventually, you get to where you declare you've cleared all of the product backlog that you want to clear. And at that point, you close up shop, at least for the time being, and you shipped a product. <sighs> Scrum's kind of a neat methodology, and I've spent a lot of time over these lectures kind of throwing shade a little bit, but at the end of the day, if you really literally follow the scrum process and are not doing scrum butt and you've got a trained scrum master who who can help you run that right and you've got a quality product owner who really knows how to do that job um, and the developers are all into it and are all good communicators it really is a fun way to build software and honestly the tent one of the big tensions in software development is how do we make it fun? And that sounds stupid, but again, software more than any other kind of engineering I know is people. And if you don't make it fun, people won't be able to do it. You know, the things we ask software developers to do in their jobs are pretty large and pretty hard. And you really want to make it something where they as people feel like they're doing well. You know, the tendency of the industry is to throw money at things. Well, you're not happy, we'll pay you more. That will make you happy. No, no, it really doesn't so much. What makes you happy is working in ways that you're comfortable with, and that having happy people around you, having reasonable workloads, having tasks that you think you can do, seeing progress. Scrum's a decent way to achieve those things, especially for certain classes of projects. So that's what I have to tell you about that. Like I say, I'll try to provide you with some other materials about Scrum. I'll link them somewhere so that 
you can get perspectives from more experienced and advanced people. Hope this was helpful. As always, uh, please stay safe and well out there. And thank you very much for listening. I'll talk to you again soon.